Hi, I'm Scott Ross, and we're here at episode one, the first. That would be episode one. That would almost be the good one, because episode two we all know is the good one. But episode one of where we're going, we don't need any roads. Um, sort of a takeoff on a movie that I was involved with years ago called Back to the Future. And today we have uh, two guests, Ryan Woodward from um, Riot and has got a background in animation and art and um, worked at a bunch of studios in the past before he worked at Riot. And then we have uh, a fellow that's become a friend over the years because we, same, we share a same sort of genetic DNA, though he is my Japanese brother <laughs> and I'm his Jewish American brother, but uh, uh, Shuzo Shota, who runs uh, Polygon Pictures. In, uh, in Tokyo, Japan. So um, I thought that given both of your perspectives and where you come from, you both sort of similarly ha have similar ideas and concepts of how to work, but in some ways you sit on opposite sides of the fence, right? right. So we have a guy who's a honcho, manager of a pretty big company, mm -hmm. and then we have an artist who heads up teams of artists and oftentimes in that environment, um, there's, uh, there's oftentimes structural issues and sometimes even sort of, sort of political issues and yeah. social issues mm -hmm. between management and the employees, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know I've had them in my companies at Industrial Light and Magic and Digital Domain. Mm -hmm. um, but the two of you are here at THU and the, and the whole sense of THU is to break down those barriers. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, really feeling the love and understanding that we're one community mm -hmm. and, and that there are, the enemies are not each other at all. We're mm -hmm. here to help each other. Mm -hmm. But those kinds of conflicts sort of come up oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. your experiences on, first, how, does it exist and what forms does it take when, when it does exist, those mm -hmm. kinds of conflicts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It absolutely exists. I think just by nature, you have um, artists that, uh, that 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 really like to express, you know, themselves in their work. Mm -hmm. They really like to put a personal touch mm -hmm. on things. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of like ingrained into them from a kid all the way through, you know, the, their their schooling. Mm -hmm. And um, especially with young artists, when they get into a studio environment, mm -hmm. and they need to focus on the task at hand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that individuality takes on more of an attitude, mm -hmm. and, and it certainly can um, be a conflict. It almost seems like sometimes it's sort of, there has to be a common enemy, right, mm -hmm. in a way. My experience is, you know, when I ran companies is there, whenever there's a ton of effort towards mm -hmm. like finishing the finish line, mm -hmm. it, it almost sort of helps to have a common enemy and the common enemy at times with the artist community, mm -hmm. it's management's fault, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and I always felt that that's the furthest thing from the truth. In fact, the only reason I ever had a job and pulled down a paycheck was because of people like you. They, mm -hmm. they, Jim Cameron or Steven Spielberg wasn't coming to work with me. Mm -hmm. They were coming to work with you. Mm -hmm. And so if I didn't take care of you mm -hmm. as a group, mm -hmm. well, then I don't have a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shuzo? Uh, yeah, I agree completely. <laughs> I don't, well, the common enemy, well, um, there, I mean, from my vantage point, there's always this conflict between the artists and the production management people, and uh, they gripe about each other. Uh, the, the production management will gripe about how uh, uh, um, non-behaving or how much, uh, 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 what do you call it, babysitting the artist needs. It's a good the, word. <laughs> it's a really good word. <laughs> the, the artists will complain about, you know, how non-knowledgeable the production management people are about the processes of the work, you know, and it's this constant conflict. In, in Japan, um, 
you know, the, 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 this, there's a certain dif difference between, say, like in North America and in Japan in that we do have issues with production management in that, uh, unlike America, we don't have schools that teach, uh, like, film and productions and, and before going into to the studio. So most of our production management people come from outside of the industry. So, you know, we have to source people from outside because we don't have people off the shelf that can, you know, do production management. So, of course, they don't know much about uh, production coming in. So they do have a handicap. So that sort of fuels the, 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 the combat nature um, a little bit. But, yeah, that's always going on, and that's, that's always the headache that, you know, we have to deal with. How about, like, communication within the artist community within a company? I, I, again, yeah. I, I, I take, I, you know, I haven't run a company like that for now. It's... 10 years, it's yeah. been 10 years since mm. I've been out of running corp, corp I, I'm an ex honcho, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, um, you know, you look at it and the problems oftentimes that we had was that you had really intelligent men and women as artists. They were, these were not necessarily blue collar workers. These were well-educated, advanced degree, well-read men and women, um, and they communicated amongst themselves but they never fully understood what management was doing, so they were constantly second-guessing. It was almost yeah. like, well, I know better, right? So does, does that happen in the companies that you've worked for? Yeah, especially when I was younger. I mean, um, I made a lot of mistakes, and I was one of those guys that you wanted to fire. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember on Iron Giant, my supervisor nicknamed me Raging Bull. Oh. Because I was just, uh, I was... An arrogant son of a gun that just... That's a many years ago, though. How many years ago is that? Uh, 20, 20 or 18, something yeah, like something that. Yeah, something like that, yeah. And, you know, I thought I could conquer the world. Mm -hmm. you know? I thought I knew everything. It's, and, and I think a lot of these younger guys still have that. But over the, the course of time, um, I've, I've, I've come to this... Uh, like, I'm at this studio now where it's a, they call it a flat hierarchy. Mm which presents a, a lot of unique challenges mm -hmm. and, and positives. But one of the things that I really um, have learned to do is, like, I really enjoy that people solve problems differently now. Mm -hmm. Whereas I always felt when I was younger that you had to, you had to, you had to solve it my way. There has to be one My way, way or the yeah. highway. Yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. Even though you're both trying to same, solve the same problem, yep. it's the methodology be ta be, you know, behind how you solve it. Mm -hmm. and. I've come to um, almost like really enjoy and thrive on those different personalities now. Mm -hmm. One guy is just a type personality, likes mm -hmm. to punch the wall, mm -hmm. and I get behind him like you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then other guys are thoughtful and really pensive, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I like that more than the conforming. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's a that's a change I had to make, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and if people haven't made a change similar to that, it's the artists are always going to spit that yeah. rumor mill. Right. Well, yeah. one of the things from that a management I, position, how do you address that? Well, no, actually, well, one of the things that I try to do, you know, and it's it's it's, it's running a company is is sort of exactly like producing a film or producing anything, and that I I would rather, I I you know it, the, the trouble with people, I mean trouble with um, staff, is that it's very easy to become complacent and and to uh, uh, because artists, in some way, like to like their own field. You know, they they like it. They feel comfortable in this own thing. And 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 uh, usually, people who come to work for a company that's like three hundred people, are um, they have this one field, and they don't mind you know working alongside alongside in processes rather than say, okay, I'm an artist. I, I want to do one to ten everything. Um, we don't get that type of people. You know, they are mostly, uh, I would say, specialists, art, yeah. specialist artisans. Right. And uh, uh, so when you have those types of people, they tend to get complacent and stuck, you know, in this circle. So what I need to do from time to time is throw in an agitator. To who, shake it up. To shake it up. Or you know, somebody yeah. who's not. Now, obviously, they need to share in the vision. They need to be really good people. But, you know, to shake up the processes so that they can wake up. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, this fellow Japanese will be working in a different way, but also bringing in people from overseas with, you know, different cultural backgrounds and different ways of communication. Uh, 
just to shake things up, you know, and I, I, I find that a constant process and, and it has to keep on going uh, or else, you know, the, the vibe of the company will start to get very mellow. You know, it's interesting you say that because um, my experience is, you know, at, at the time when we were really hiring back in the early 90s, mid 90s, I remember making a comment, um, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys, let them grow up to be digital artists. I mean, we were so desperate for talent. There was yeah. not... You know, like for example, at ILM in the 80s, when we started to do Terminator 2, I guess it was, mm -hmm. I needed people and I went on a worldwide search to hire people and I could only find 30, mm -hmm. 30 people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the entire T2 team. Mm -hmm. But it was really difficult sort of to find people. So as a result, we were hiring internationally when I was at Digital Domain. Right. And the cultural differences were huge. Mm -hmm. It was almost like there was this continuum, so I'll do it towards camera. On right. this side right. were the Italians. Right, right, right. right. And on this side were the mm -hmm. Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the Japanese worked incredibly well in teams, mm -hmm. um, and they never really questioned authority. You told them <laughs> what to do, they would do it. They'd work their you know, butts off. They'd put in 20 hours. They would not complain, yeah. and it was, Get it done, right? Yeah. And the Italians were, again, I pick on Italians. And for all those Italians out there, I love you all. <laughs> but, you know, the Italians um, or Western Europeans right. were, were uh, you know, very much, you know, uh, abundanza. You know, was, life was big and beautiful. It was all an opera. They were incredibly creative. And they hated everybody who had an opinion because their way was the right way. Right, right, right. So <laughs> has that changed over time as the, as the artist base has become sort of a digital migration of digital gypsies around the world? Have you seen changes like, for example, in your company where people are less on that sort of Japanese side of getting stuff done, listening to the boss? And do you now have sort of that infiltration of that sort of Western artist sensibility? Well... I'm stereotyping no, here, it, it, I mean, there's you, some truth to it. No, yeah, but you know, your stereotype is actually very, very true, and I'm, I'm sure there's been like minor changes, but from a perspective, you know, from upper level perspective, things haven't changed that much. Uh -huh. But, you know, I'm sort of pragmatic in that, okay, well, I mean, we're based in Japan, and so we'll always be a predominantly Japanese, you know, composition of a studio. Right. And uh, so, so it, it, I mean, it's great to have people from different cultures. We actually have an Italian who, who, who acts very much like the Italian that you, you expressed. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, he's, he's a genius, but my Japanese staff is just like going, ah, right. what is this guy? Come on. Right. He's right. like, Shuzo, come on, get, get all this guy. And I'm, the, I'm, this, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for, hope, for holding him down, you know? But... Um, <laughs> But I'm pragmatic in the sense that, okay, well, there will probably never be a genuine meld uh, of these two different natures. Right. But it, if, if it works for a certain period of time to elevate us to a certain level, and, but it may not last forever, this relationship may not last forever, uh, forever I think it's cool. I think it's good. It just it, it has served a purpose right. um, um, for the company and hopefully for the individuals as well. Yeah. So, so, so your growth as an individual comes out of experience and age. You said 20 years, right? Right. So is there a way for you to go to the, the young and the restless, as it were, and say to these guys and gals, hey, listen, now, I'm one of your guys. I, I, I've been in the... Tr this is a, you shouldn't be working this way. Can they hear you? Well, you can say it, but I'm a big believer in learning through experience, not through dictation. Mm-hmm. And um, if that's their personality and um, to be a little bit combative, uh, I think they need to learn it, you know, that it doesn't serve them really anything. So, so do you set it by example? Them. Well, yeah, obviously I try and set it by example. I mean, one of the challenges I see a lot is, like, I came from film where it's very rigorous, where mm -hmm. every day you have a task where you got to get on that locomotive and it's flying and if you stall or jump off for a second, it's gone. Right. Um, and it affects the whole rest of the entire vehicle that's moving. Right. right? It, it's a very, it's, it's, it's really important that you stay on that thing, no matter what, how fast it's going. Um, other companies have a little bit more of a lackadaisical attitude and, and you get some 
employees that are used to that, and they just like taking their time on things. And then you get employees with that that film or animation or intense studio background. That can create even some issues, like you said, between the Italians and the Japanese. That just those backgrounds can create problems. Like right. the workers. So not even not even geographic issues, more cultural issues in terms of the work you've done. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. They that, just want to work. The others want to go easy. And that would definitely be an issue, yes. yes, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Now, you said, you know, at Blur, it's a flat studio, right? Right. Right. Explain that to, to the viewers. Like, what does that look like? Is it's, it's, it's very complex, and I'm still trying to figure it out completely. Uh -huh. Because... Um, Coming from the hierarchy of the studio, that felt very right. Like I could, I could really understand it. I knew my place. I knew when to speak up, and I knew when not to speak up. Mm. And you knew the channels to go to to be able to hopefully assess and fix the problem. Yeah, I never step above anybody right. mm. with an issue. It's right. always the direct oh, uh, supervisor. I see. I see. And it was just, I just knew my place after a certain amount of time and I respected that mm -hmm. I understood it mm -hmm. and then I come to a place like riot where it's a flat oh, hierarchy right right mm -hmm. and this you know this seems to be kind of a trendy thing with a lot of these younger companies mm. and even though um, you know uh, I love riot but even though it, the flat hier hierarchy is um, is is sort of professed it it isn't really as flat as <laughs> as it as, tends to be. Yeah, there's uh, there's going to be that sort of stacking. Right, uh, right. But uh, there's good parts of that and there's bad parts. Mm -hmm. the, the the bad part is sometimes that sort of empowers everyone on the floor to mm -hmm. be able to contribute at all levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean. That mm -hmm. would just that's sometimes very, very challenging for management, mm -hmm. right. you know, and very challenging for artists too that have experience and then, and, but everybody's trying to contribute. Right, mm -hmm. right. It becomes, sometimes it can become very, very disorganized and um, problematic. And probably very, very frustrating because if you give sort of a junior level person the feeling that they have the ability to affect change, yes. right? And you don't give them the structure, the hierarchy with which to affect change, right. mm -hmm. then they think they're affecting change, and then they, might, they don't have the experience to really affect the change, mm -hmm. one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And two, oftentimes they might feel like their, their hands are tied because they actually, the change that they're suggesting doesn't get implemented. Right. Right? So that's pretty there's frustrating a, as well. There's actually a, um, there's a scientific theory, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it is a, it's a study that these guys did because mm -hmm. this one guy went into to rob a bank and he got caught. He didn't understand why he got caught because he put lemon juice all over his face. And since lemon juice is the main ingredient of invisible ink, he thought he'd be invisible. Yeah, it, it's completely absurd, yeah. right? Yeah. But this guy believed that. He right. really believed that. He, so much that he could go in and rob a bank. Right. And they, so they did this study, and there's this interesting graph of how much you really do know about a subject mm -hmm. and how much you think, think you, you know, know about a subject. About yeah. a subject. Mm -hmm. And as you gain experience in the subject, mm -hmm. how much you think you know drops. Oh, right. I see, I see. So mm -hmm. you get this crossing point mm -hmm. that does that. So... It, you know, if you get really experienced guys, mm -hmm. they've experienced so much that they understand that there is right. even a lot more that we they do not don't know. understand. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're very, very thoughtful about every problem that comes up. Mm -hmm. And then you got these younger guys that really think they know everything, <laughs> you know, and they're contributing like mad. So, <laughs> right. you know, they've got the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, they, they, they need that experience to start getting to that point where you got to stop serving over. lemon juice yeah, yeah. <laughs> no lemon juice right, no yeah lemon now, juice. now she was like, you talked about kaizen the other day yeah, yeah, yeah. and that was you know I, I grew up in a point in time managing companies in the 80s right and when the 80s were happening uh -huh. japan was like right. you know um, american industry went we are wrong mm -hmm. clearly the japanese have it mm -hmm. and i remember going to meetings where 
I would sit, let's say, at Machusta, mm -hmm. and the chairman of Machusta, mm -hmm. you could tell who the chairman was because he was the oldest guy in the room, mm -hmm. and he was sleeping. <laughs> you know, so like there was an entire board of people there, and the younger guys right. spoke the most, oh. and the older guys didn't really speak, and the chairman was like... <laughs> so how, do, how, how does... How does Kaizen work? I, I assume it has to be organized, managed, because if not, it becomes like what you were talking about, sort of a free-for-all, where yeah, everybody feels be. they have access to change. Well, yeah, I mean, but, but they actually do. It's just, uh, but, it's, but the, the process is in, in ideas. Uh, uh, the, um, the trick is, is getting how many ideas you can get in the bowl. Uh -huh. that, that doesn't assure that these ideas will be picked up. I mean, so it's just, it's the process of, okay, throw in all your ideas about certain issues. What do you think are the issues? What do you think your ideas to the issues? And you throw it in a bowl, bowl. And then we would, from time to time, assess these ideas and prioritize. Now that, nobody, uh, that, that, that part of the process, not everybody has access to. So that's a hierarchical procedure right. where senior management right. reviews ideas that bubble up right. and then makes assessments right. based upon what they think is valid. Right. So, I mean, the trick or, or, or the challenge is to, 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 to generate this mood and this environment where regardless of the fact that their ideas may or may not be noticed, the, the constant throwing in of ideas, and that's right. the challenge, right. you know, uh, uh, um, to, to, to generate that kind of mood uh, amongst the, the people um, to continue to do so. Right. Yeah. So, so that reminds me of like, uh, so go to the Wayback Machine. <laughs> so early on when we were talking about sort of interactive movies, you might remember, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this discussion about interactive movies where the audience could wind up so it, it came as a result of laser discs, right? right. So you, you now had the ability to stack a bunch of laser discs and have branching within a movie. Uh -huh. And that what they would do early experiments, so they'd take a, a movie theater of let's say a hundred people, they'd give them this controller, mm -hmm. and it would come to a decision point, and then everybody in the movie theater could press a button, and then the one that had the most presses, that's the direction the movie went. Uh -huh. It didn't work right. because. The individual who pressed three, mm -hmm. maybe there he was not in the majority, and two was the majority. So now you got a pissed off three guy. Right. He's right. pressed three because he wants it to go that way, but mm -hmm. lo and behold, it goes that way. Right. So do you f have those kinds of problems where these <laughs> oh. people are coming up with these ideas and they're like, "Well, oh, stupid management. They chose his way." Right. Of there, there, there's, there, there's always issues like that where you know again that's so that's the trick of. Uh, keeping them motivated to throw in the ideas, regardless of the fact that their ideas might may not why be not? chosen. So it's it's a uh, it's it's well. And uh, so on the other hand, why it's chosen and why we choose to do this and prioritize over over this one uh, has to be transparent in a way. So mm -hmm. we do have to explain you know, why why are we doing this? Why are we putting money on this? Because I mean, um, the employees know that resources R and D resources uh, are, are limited. limited. Right. Um, we we have a monthly meeting exposing what our PNL is. Right. We know they also, I mean, if you're an employee, they know what our situation is. Right. They know our annual uh, budgets for allocated for these kind of things, and so so we do have to explain that there is a limit to what we can do, and we have chosen prior prioritized to do this over this because we think this and that. They may not agree to that. Right. You know, but at least they know what the what the reasons are. I, I always yeah. felt that you know that one of the that so many things come up, but I always felt that one of the most important things that the m senior management and management can do is um, communicate really well and get communication back. So, like when I was running ILM and Digital Domain, I would have Friday noon meetings uh -huh. every every Friday, mm. and senior management, the head of feature production, the head of commercial production, head of the, you know, head of the studio, the, et cetera, we would all come in and we would sort of give like a report to any employee who wanted to show up and in the good times we'd actually feed them, right? But um, what we felt was that they at least knew what was going on, yeah. right? And that the more information we could give them, to a point. Mm -hmm. There was a point yeah. where we couldn't give them enough information, too much inf we If we gave them too much information, it would backfire. They were yeah. scared. Right, it like, would backfire. we're strapped for cash, we can't right. pay you next week. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. would be a difficult one. So, um, and then what, we, what came about as a result of that is the employees 
wound up putting together a group of representatives. Right. Right. And those groups represented the employees, mm -hmm. and they came to management, mm -hmm. and that seemed to work really well. Yeah. 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 The the transparency thing, I think, is 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 a good thing. Uh huh. Um, but I think on that ground floor, the thing that has helped everybody more than anything is just trusting the people in management. Mm -hmm. If that's there, management can do their job. Mm -hmm. They don't have to worry so much about the artists and whether they're fed every bit of information. Right. But if there's that, that trust... How, how do you build that trust? How does that trust come about? Like if It can't be forced. Right, of course. You know, right? you can't say, trust me. Right, of course. When the person doesn't, maybe doesn't have the experience. Uh -huh. yeah. But if the person comes in with some experience and um, they have a track record, uh -huh. then you really need to trust them because they're going to do the same to you with your work. Right. And I think that mutual trust is... It, almost more important than the information. There's a lot of stuff I didn't know anything about going on, in, on, on on the film crews. And I trusted those guys to take care of everything. Sure. Trusted it to be resolved. And it almost seems like I was easily happy with that. Mm -hmm. You get to, a, like, on the flip side of Riot, one of the good things is the, the creative sort of T-shaped thing that artists can do. They can... They can really work in their craft, but they have that ability to start learning, you know, other crafts and kind of spread out. Mm. Um, that's the flip side. Right. You know, and that's why it's attractive to a lot of artists. Yeah. Shuzo, how, how do you build trust? Well, uh, I mean, is this so, at this point, you've been there forever, mm. so they know you. Right. Right? Well, I mean, this, well, I mean, I, 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 I can't speak about myself, about how my guys trust me, because it's me. So, uh, but it's hard. But um, one, I think, you know, um, I think they trust the fact that I'm seeing the farthest ahead, and they see my activities, you know, uh, all around the world. They see the friends that I have, the connections, and and that's a that's a pretty big wow factor mm -hmm. in Japan. So, and, and, and two, they, and I'm, uh, I, I think I'm pretty real mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I get to converse with them. I'm usually the crackhead in the meeting. Um, um, and, and there's a, there's a, there's an element where, oh, shoes, oh my God. So we have to do it for him because he ain't going to do it kind of thing. You know, they know that I don't do a lot of stuff. Right. And so, um, again, I think there is a division of labor where my position is, what I need to do, and, and what they have to do because they know that I'm not going to do it. Um, for good or for bad, I'm not, I'm not infringing on their, ter ter their territory, and I think they know that. So, that's, yeah, I think that's what it is. For me, what I, what I, I always felt is that if the executive management is not cut from the same cloth mm. as the employee, mm -hmm. it's going to be a diff difficult gap. So now, and I, what I mean by the same cloth, right. I don't mean that, and in fact, I, I, I would contradict that, that, you know, chances are you'll, it's going to be very difficult to find a visual effects supervisor mm -hmm. that knows how to run a company. Right. Mm -hmm. Similarly, it would be difficult to find a, a, a CEO mm -hmm. to be a visual effects supervisor. But right. what I mean by the same cut of cloth, mm -hmm. and I think you said it last night in your talk, mm -hmm. was that you got your groove on. Mm -hmm. And so you come from a perspective, mm -hmm. culturally, mm -hmm. of the same, you, you like the stuff they like, you speak the same language that they speak. Mm -hmm. You know, you might n not understand the way certain software packages work or whatnot, but no. You're the same kind of peeps, is right. what I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I think that's important. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, I speak in a level where, of course, we're not, I mean, I don't, I don't meddle with each of the projects and how they are done uh, and what they do, but it's, I speak in a way, okay, are we, the stuff that we, we are doing, is it, does it look cool enough? Right. I mean, do, do you think it's cool enough for, for Polygon? So they respect your taste level. I think they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and, and and not just even the projects, but our activities are how we are uh, operating ourselves. I mean, are we cool enough? Uh, uh, is is this something that is forward minded? Um, um, and does it contribute to what we do in the future? So I talk more in the level of, uh, uh, I don't know, like hu human and, and, and philosophy and that kind of stuff, and where we want to be. Uh, uh, 
that I think, in, in terms of you're the same cloth, I think they aspire to rather the same things okay. that I do. So you're new to this new company, and you and it sounds like you're loving it. Um, yeah. The leaders of the company have they set the cultural sort of standard of what the company is about, and yes, and what is it? Yeah, they've set it re um, really strong. In fact, we just had a big conference where again they were restating it over and over and over. Um, but it's this default to trust, and it's about um, having steel toes mm -hmm. and feedback. Being able to give the feedback re respectfully, and you better be able to take the feedback, no matter how it is delivered. You better be able to take it, honestly, you know, look at it and, and decide whether you need to make some changes. The cultural aspect of a company is really, I think is really critical, and we talked about that before. Yeah. And it's sort of, I think it, it's pervasive from the CEO or the owner of the company. When I first started at Industrial Light and Magic, um, the, the, the essence of the company had transitioned from its George Lucas's company mm -hmm. to it became Dennis Murin's company. I and I was really shocked when I got there because I came from a company where I was running this video post house in, in San Francisco mm -hmm. called One Pass, mm -hmm. and I was the CEO. So I set the standards and the culture of the company. So right. I showed up at ILM thinking, well, I'm the, I'm the new guy, mm -hmm. right? And it was, there was getting to know you, getting to love you, but I assumed the position that, well, I'm the guy who's running the company, so now it's my agenda to set the, and I was really shocked that everybody in the company is sort of like, you, they called me the green carpet guy because there was green carpet out in the executive offices. And they were like, shut up. You don't know anything. This is Dennis Murin's company. Uh -huh. And I was shocked. I, I mean, I didn't know what to do. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until there was that change from, interestingly enough, from analog to digital mm -hmm. where I felt that I was coming from comfort because mm -hmm. I... I was running a company that was computer digitally based, mm -hmm. video post production, mm -hmm. that I was able to make the transition that mm -hmm. ILM sort of became the company that I was running and I was setting the culture for it. Mm. So um, are those kinds of challenges that you guys face in terms of making sure the culture is correct? And if, if you don't have those, what do you do to, to, to infuse the culture and get the people sort of excited about doing things? Because it can't be just about pixels, right? Right. It really has to be about a higher, loftier goal. Mm -hmm. You're doing stuff that changes the way people see things. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, is that run true in your companies? Well, I, I don't think there's a right way and a wrong way mm -hmm. to run a company. I think the, the, the culture can be very different. I really enjoyed the hierarchy of film. Uh -huh. I felt safe there. In this, uh, in this new company, I really feel like I can give some feedback and I can take a heck of a lot of feedback. So I don't think it's a right and a wrong. I think it's more about knowing your place mm. and contributing with the knowledge that you genuinely have, not just trying to contribute because you're granted the voice. Right. Mm. That's, mm. Where it gets, that's where it gets a little messy. And at the same time, um, being able to be a person that when people come to you and say, uh, you know, you got to change a little bit of this. It's really annoying people. And be able to say, oh my gosh, I didn't know. Thank you I guys. I can hear you. Yeah, I, I hear, hear you. I'm, I'm going to work on that. And next week I'm going to show you how I've worked on cool. that. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's very difficult for a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of people to take it. Mm -hmm. So that's where there's, there's a positive on both sides. And as long as people understand their place mm -hmm. and respect for each other and the trust, I think they both it works. can work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said um, I, I said in yesterday's talk, but um, I, I genuinely feel uh, like like you, Scott, with ILM. I did not start Polygon. Mm -hmm. I came in when it was 13 years old, and. Uh, the founder was still there, and at that time was was very much the founder's company. Sure. And I got to be his lieutenant because he liked me. Um, but there was all these all these things, and then he left, and I was left to, you know, babysit the animal. But um, I truly do feel that a company is a 
living matter, mm -hmm. living being on its own. It, it has a life of its own, and, and I, I, I know it because it behaves in certain ways where I would feel, I mean, it, it's so surprising. Like, for instance, there, was, there, were, there were times that we were running out of cash and we could have gone bankrupt at any time. But then, miraculously, their money came in through the help of our investors and whatnot, and then we got to live again. But that wasn't a doing of me or anyone of anybody. It was just, the, I think, I felt, I felt like it was the urge of this company, the person called Polygon Pictures, wanting to live longer. Right. I really felt it. And so um, I, I, Polygon is definitely the child of Toshi Kawahara, and it's got his DNA. But like a father-son relationship, there's a time where the son departs from the father, you know, and, or the father has to find another position. Unfortunately, Toshi couldn't find that position, so he's not with Polygon anymore, and I'm the stepfather. And so, but I, but I, I my, my mission is to, 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 to make the best out of the DNA that he left to this being called Polygon so that Polygon can be the best kid ever. Right. And the staff and the employees are the blood and, 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 and the cells that, that keep it going. And like I said, you know, our body uh, uh, regenerates 700 billion cells a day. Our body changes three, five years. And we, the employees, the people, including us, are the blood and cell that generates, you know, uh, that, that moves the current polygon, but we may uh, not be here forever. Right. The only thing we can do is to make sure that this being is, is healthy and, and can be the best that ever. And that's, I really truly feel that. Great. Yeah. So, you know, sort of I've, having been the sort of the founder of Digital Domain, mm -hmm. so I call that Digital Domain, mm -hmm. but then there was a Digital Domain 2.0, right. and now there's a Digital Domain 3.0, mm -hmm. and in some ways there's, sort of genetic matter that's sort of still there to you know underscore what mm. you're saying but digital domain 3.0 is a totally different company right. than the company that i founded 25 years ago mm -hmm. so um i get it what, one last question thing i want to throw out there is i've just recently learned and you use the 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 word right i think i think it's cool i used to always want to give people criticism mm -hmm. and um and in my relationship my marriage now I've realized that you can't give criticism. You can only give feedback. So when you give feedback, the response from the other person is, I hear you. When you give criticism, it's like, you know, kafangul, <laughs> right? So that, that difference is that use of word is important. So uh, we'll wrap up today on giving feedback to the THU TV community to say, um, tell a friend, have them, uh, Take, a, take advantage of so the expertise that we bring on THU TV and the insights, and you'll learn whether you're an, an aspiring manager, executive, founder of a company, and or you'll learn if you're an artist working in within an environment. I think this has been invaluable. I really appreciate your time, and thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much.